Thanks so much. It's a real pleasure to be introducing um, our keynote for today um, and Professor Lucy Munro. Um, uh, as many of you know, Lucy is Professor of Shakespeare and, and Literature at King's College London, um, and she's also the co-director of the newly launched Shakespeare Centre London, um, uh, operating between uh, King's and Shakespeare's Globe. Um, Lucy's work in early modern studies and Shakespeare studies is incredibly wide ranging and prolific and she's made important contributions um, in, in many different areas, um, but they, uh, to a significant extent, include both theatre history and book history, so given the topic of our conference, I think she's a, um, a very fitting keynote speaker at Eid. Um, her work on repertory studies and the ways in which thinking about theatre companies um, can be very important to how we understand early modern drama, um, has been um, uh, particularly influential. Um, her first book, Children of the Queen's Rebels, a Jacobean theatre repertory, uh, was published by Cambridge uh, in 2005. Um, and indeed, her most recent book is A Study of the King's Men, um, which came out with uh, um, the Shakespeare in the Theatre series um, published by Bloomsbury Arden uh, recently. She's also uh, published an important book on archaism in early modern English literature um, in 2013 uh, with Cambridge. Um, she does a lot of important collaborative work as well. Um, she's a co-investigator on the Before Shakespeare Project, um, and she's one of the, um, the lead scholars on engendering the stage uh, together with Professor Claire McManus um, at Roehampton. Um, she's also um, a, a very important editor, and she's edited for just about every series uh, you, can, uh, you can think of, New Mermaids, Arden Alley Wooden Drama, Globe Portos, um, the forthcoming uh, Oxford Marston. Um, and she's currently working on an edition of Henry IV Part I uh, for the new Arden Shakespeare uh, Fourth series. Her paper today is entitled Company Politics and Credit Publication. Um, please join me in welcoming Lucy Munro. Thank you very much. Um, is this working okay? Yeah. I'm sort of multitasking slightly with an iPad and the slides and the microphone, so hopefully I won't drop anything. Turn the stage. <laughs> Don't be terrible. Um, I want to say thank you very much indeed to Simon for that really generous introduction. Um, to the organisers, organisers for inviting me, um, it's lovely to be here um, at the conference. And also I'd like to thank my MA students um, who would have been having a seminar with me today and were very understanding when I explained <laughs> <my own parents. laughs> So I want to begin with a joke, one that's a little short of its own 400th year anniversary. When asked another, what Shakespeare's works were worth all being bound together? He answered, not a farthing. Not worth a farthing, said he. What so? He answered that his plays were worth a great deal of money, but he never heard that his works were worth anything at all. So I didn't say it was a good joke. <laughs> <laughs> this is, of course, a variation of the theme in a well known pair of epigrams in the folio edition of Ben Johnson's works. Uh, Pray tell me, Ben, where doth the mystery lurk? What others call the play, you call the work? And the response, the author's friend, thus the author says, Ben's plays are works when other works are plays. Both jokes pivot on the relationship between works and plays, but where the Johnson joke focuses on authorship and literary prestige, the Shakespeare joke involves another kind of value, financial work. As such, it's in the spirit of John Hennings and Henry Condell's letter to the reader for the prefaces of 1623 folio which notoriously exhorts the reader at the bookstore, whatever you do, buy. <laughs> but it also suggests a division between performance and print. In the theatres, it suggests Shakespeare's plays are valuable commodities, but their status of literary artefacts is less certain. In this talk, I seek to break down this opposition. I'm interested to hear less in the cultural value of the portfolio format than in the opportunities that collections featuring a number of plays offer the King's Men, and the ways in which collections of plays can represent a theatrical enterprise. I argue that we should think of dramatic folios as books that embody an important aspect of the traffic of the plays, that is, the playing company itself, and that they both construct and contest the relative cultural and commercial status of those companies. Further, I contend that the dramatic folio of the early to mid 17th century is increasingly trafficked through and with the connivance of the King's Men, 
the most powerful company of their day, ultimately acting as a memorial to them in the 1657 edition of the plays of Fletcher and his collaborators, and especially in its companion volume, a single play folio edition of Fletcher's Wild Goose Chase. I will focus on four folios with especially strong links to the plan companies, the 1616 Ben Johnson folio, the 1623 Shakespeare folio, the 1647 Fletcher folio, and this 1652 folio edition of Wild Goose Chase. And I'm going to refer to the rest of the school with this 1616 folio, 1652 folio, and so on. In some, in some respects, my paper is responding to Ralph Adams's elegant recent critique of the ways in which the authority focused traditions, such as the 1616 folio, the 1623 folio, and the 1647 folio, um, reflect a Copernican universe in which everything revolves around the brightest star or author, which outshines every other object in the cosmos. The sun or our star or author, with his inevitable gravitational pull, orders the universe in such a way that it seems perfectly formed. However, this very order regrettably disallows most other stars and planets from being anything other than distant orthogonal satellites, wholly dependent upon the generous system. Adams is thinking has influenced my decision to place the 1623 folio alongside other genetic folios, and to look in detail at the ways in which authorially focused folio volumes nonetheless present alternative forms of authority, in this case, that of the company. As a start, it's useful to look at broader trends in early to mid 17th century publication of plays in folio. And I put in the slide here a list of um, folio editions from Samuel Daniel's works on the York Metric um, from 1601 to 2 through to um, the 15, 1653 edition of Henry Killigrew's Plantis and Flora. And I've put um, transcriptions of the title pages here because they give you an idea of the ways in which these volumes are theatrically oriented. So, with the exception of Daniel's folio, which includes a closet play titled with Cleopatra, the publication of plays in folio between 1616 and 1653 privileges the King's Men. But it doesn't mean that only plays of the King's Men were printed in folio. Folio collections listed here all include plays performed by the companies. But that the paratextual material of these folios are King's Men focused. Moreover, all the single play folios are explicitly linked with the King's Men. Sucklings like Laura and Dennis and Sophie are presented on their title pages as King's Men plays. And while no company is specified on the title page of Plantis from Eudora, a revised version of Philippines of Conspiracy, the publisher John Hardesty recalls the presentation of this play at Blackfriars in his address to the reader. So to start with the 1616 folio, um, and I took the opportunity to slide in the Bibliothek um, Mazarin's um, copy of the <laughs> Johnson folio. The 1616 folio is traditionally regarded as a book that's overwhelmingly concerned with presenting and constructing authorship. Yet it is also an intense and theatrical volume, and one concerned with the workings of the commercial stage, and also of the mass stage and the entertainment kind of venue, um, although. I'm not going to talk about this in detail today. The 1616 folio differs from its predecessor by presenting within a works folio plays deriving from the commercial stage. Moreover, it does not seek to hide the place commercial origins, appending to each a page detailing the year of the place first performance, the company that performed it, principal comedians or tragedians that acted in it, and the fact of its allowance of performance by the Master of the Brothers. The plays are concentrated at the start of the volume, but the commercial theatre also seeps into other sections of the volume, invisibly in the masks, where the contribution of professional actors is not generally acknowledged, and explicitly in the grants, which include the panegyric of Edward Alain, elegy of the boy actress Alan Pavey, two poems addressed to playwright, and other poems that feature plays or playing prominently, such as to a weak gaze from poetry and to mine. Some material linking the plays to their performance context is actually lost in the reported folio, such as the names of the actors in the induction to Simple's Rebels. Um, as Lynn was suggesting in class, oh, sorry, as Lynn was suggesting in class a few moments ago, the collection presents a retrospective view of Johnson's work on the commercial stage as well. 
all of the place quickly to accept epicenes of fibrin cortisone. And epicenes itself entered in the station's register on 20th of September 1610 and reassigned to Mons of Burr on 20th of September 1612. No copies survive of these editions very largely produced. The collection doesn't include Johnson's two newest plays in 1616, but Volume III, performed by Lady Elizabeth's men in 1614, or The Devil is a Mass, performed by the King's men in 1616 itself. The most original theatrical framing in the 1616 folio appears in the Antipas. These lists have a memorializing function that is heightened by the inclusion of the original performance dates and the names of the companies. Of the companies represented in the volume, Children of the Chapel and Queen's Revels were defunct by 1616, and the King's Men have recently faced a number of deaths among their leading actors. Um, Alexander Cook died in February 1614. William Osler in December 1614, Robert Armin in November 1615, and Shakespeare in April 1616. Other deceased colleagues feature in the activists, so Thomas Pope, who died in 1603, Augustine Phillips, who died in 1605, William Kemp, who probably died around 1603, although that's disputed, um, William Sly, who died in 1608, and George Bryan, who may have died around 1612. The activists mark the shifting status of some performers, such as Oster and John Underwood, who were clear of children of the Queen's Elizabeth's Chapel and the King's Men, and alive others. Nathan Field appears in the activists as a child of Queen Elizabeth's Chapel and a child of Her Majesty's Rebels, but in 1616 he recently became a member of the King's Men and may have appeared in the Devil as an ass. One oddity in the activists is their omission of the name of Lawrence Fletcher. Who appeared in the royal patent issued to the King's Men in 1603 and the fee list that was compiled in 1607. He died in 1608, so the play in which he's most likely to have played is Bob Crane. And it's possible that he didn't appear in this play, not every actor appeared in every play and um, original performances. Or there might be another reason for his omission. Um, I sometimes wonder if just nobody really liked him very much, but he was <laughs> excluded for that reason. A copy of the 1616 folio now held by the Huntington Library, first brought to scholars' attention by James A. Liddell, has annotations by an older reader that amplify the theatrical framing of the book. This reader has written actors' names against character names in the list of persons in the play, the Volcano and the Alchemist, and character names against actors' names in the lists of the principal comedians, the Epicene and the Alchemist. The annotations to Volcone and the Alchemist relate to revivals in the late 1610s between the arrival of Nathan Field and the death of Richard Burbage in 1619. And I've given you an example on the um, slide here of the annotations to the persons of the play and the principal comedians in The Alchemist. Taking together these annotations and, and the original texts create a palimpsest of original and revival performances that's similar to that presented in the 1623 quarter edition of Webster's Dutch St. Malfi. This edition presents a character and actor list recording the parts of two different King's Men casts of the play, one from the play's first performances around 1614, and the other from the revival around 1620 to 1623. Some of the names are probably those of the actors who played the role in both of these performances, such as John Lowen, who played Bosselin and John Underwood who played Delio. Others played roles only in the revival, such as Richard Sharp who played the Duchess, who wasn't apprenticed to John Hemmings until the 21st of February 1616. John Thompson who played Julia, the Cardinal's mistress, and Robert Howard the Younger, who played Cariola, and he was apprenticed to Hemmings on the 9th of February 1620. Printed texts such as these seem to have, seem to have encouraged the owners of printed texts such as the owner of the Huntington Folio, to annotate the character and activists of their own books. If Francis X. Connor is right to argue that Johnson tethers his place to the past and situates them in the moment of the first performance and the cast of that performance, readers' annotations would loosen those tethers and point to later performances. Moreover, such annotations in printed books probably made their way back into print again. It's likely that the activists in the 1679 second folio of Fletcher derived from an antidote of the 1647 folio. 
1616 folio is relatively even handed in its treatment of plaintiff. There is no preface signed by kings and actors or other forms of general framing that elevate the moment of children in chapter or the children in the struggles. Yet two things nonetheless privilege the chamberlains of King's men. The sheer number of plates attached to them by the company inscriptions match lists, and the fact that the king's men were the only one of the company's named in folio to be operated in 1616. The 1623 folio addresses some of the same problems as the 1616 folio, whether and how to acknowledge the theatrical auspices of plates within the Bori or Fori frame volume, but it tackles them in distinct and different ways. In contrast with the 1616 folio, the 1623 folio prints a number of plays that have not been previously printed. And you can see here the catalogue, prefacing, and collection, and then the stationers register entry of 16 plays not previously printed on the 8th of November 1623. The entry is headed Master William Shakespeare's Comedies, Mysteries, and Tragedies, so many of the said as are not formally entered to other men. And it had clearly been organized in advance of the folio, not only all the plays entered together, but the entry uses the folio to generic categories, comedies, histories, and tragedies. The entry perhaps reflects the control over their plays that the King's men appear to have been exerting in the late 1610s. In 1619, the Lord Chamberlain, um, William Herbert Earl of Pembroke, wrote to the masters and wardens of the stations, resulting in this entry and their courtliness. Upon a letter from the Right Honourable the Lord Chamberlain, it is thought fit and so ordered that no plays, His Majesty's Play, do play, shall be printed without consent of some of them. The entry is usually thought to respond to the attempted collection of plays known as the Cable Autos, though Zachary Lesser's recent work suggests that the Jaguar Auto is maybe a more accurate name for them. But the appearance of the first editions of Fletch Fremont and Fletcher's The Maid's Tragedy in the King in May also argue that the order relates more broadly to the publication of King's Men plays, as E. A. J. Honig and Louis Zerner suggested. Where the 1616 folio dedicates different texts or group of texts to different patrons, 1623 folio dedicates all of its contents to two patrons William Herbert, Earl of Pembroke, Lord Chamberlain, and his brother Philip Herbert, Earl of Montgomery. The dedication is signed by John Cummings and Henry Pondle, the two longest standing members of the Chamberlains and Kingsmen, whose involvement with the company dated back to the 1990s. Their choice of patron points to their own history in the Chamberlains' band, where their patrons have been Herbert's predecessors, Henry Carey of West Bayern Kingston, and George Carey of Second Bayern Kingston. It also points to the current status of the King's men, as the Lord Chamberlain had jurisdiction of the company as a senior official in the royal household. He was also the courtier in charge of the entertainment and the master of the master of struggles. Oddly enough, Philip Herbert had himself gone to serve as Lord Chamberlain in 1626 to 1621, though Hemings and Condal had no way of knowing this in 1623. The epistle makes a claim on the author as friend and fellow and our Shakespeare, presenting him as part of the theatrical community that Hemings and Condal represent. And that theatrical community in its recent history dominates the folio's paratextual materials. Hemmings and Condon sign the two dedicatory epistles. Johnson, a regular writer for the company, writes two of the dedicatory poems. And the dedicatory poems are followed by the names of the principal actors in the play. Hemmings and Condon also lead directly to the most recently acquired of the company's two penthouses, telling the reader, and though you be a magistrate of wit, and sit on the stage at Blackfriars or the cockpit to rebane plays daily. No, these plays have had their trial already and stood out on the fields and do now come forth footage rather by degree of court than any purchase of this accumulation. Evans and Condon established a triangular relationship between play, player, and playgirl that is also exploited by Leonard Dix in his commendatory poem recalls the life on stage of the passions of Juliet and her Romeo in the three reverses of the um, And that half saw the parlay of Romans. It culminates in the list of the names of the principal actors in all these plays. <coughs> Rather than appending the names of actors to individual plays, as in the 1616 folio, 
The Seating 23 framework aggregates them into one list, was headed by Shakespeare himself. Like the Axialists in the 1616 folio, this list has a memorializing function that's even clearer in the Adams and Key dates. So the first date here against an actor's name represents the year of the actor's first documented involvement with Chamberlain's and King's Man. The second date, if there is one, is the year in which they appear in an official list of companies' leading members. And these are the 1603 Royal Patent, 1607 Fee List. Um, a patent from 1619 and delivery list from 1621. We should note the addition of Christopher Beeston and John Duke, who appear in the actor list for Every Man in His Humour in the 1616 folio. These actors are probably omitted here because they never achieved the status of sharing. The more puzzling is the continued absence of Lawrence Fletcher, who, as I've noted, appeared in both the 1603 patent and the 1607 fee list. I mean, again, they just don't like him. Okay. <laughs> the order in which the actors appear seems to be dictated at least in part by the point at which they enter the status of sharer in the company, which would explain why Nathan Field is listed above the Lundwood with whom the actors have been children. <coughs> even though Field joined the King's Men at five, late, five years later than Lundwood. As I've suggested, this is in the main part of retrospective list. But the actors listed, only one does not appear to have performed any Shakespeare play during the actor's lifetime. And this is Joseph Taylor. And Joseph Taylor's prominence in the company in 1623 probably meant that he couldn't be omitted, even though he didn't join the King's Men until after the death of Richard Burbank in 1690. The politics of the company in 1623 apparently undercut the volume's focus on the authorial and authorizing figure of Shakespeare himself. This retrospective effect, the actor list, is heightened by the editions and copy of the 1623 folio, now held by the University of Glasgow, and drawn to scholars of mentioned by Eric Rasmussen and Manson West, a native and Smith. An early reading of the annotated the names of some of the actors with comments about their levels of knowledge of their performance. The annotator might be one of the two sons of the dramatist Elizabeth Perry, Lorenzo Perry, who signed his name on it. Or as Smith suggests, his old brother Lucius. The Carey Brothers playgoing probably dated to the 1630s, which would fit the annotations, um, which include by report against Burbage, by eyewitness against Lowen, hearsay against Oscar, and no against Taylor and Robert Benford. And the annotation against Shakespeare seems to say lease or least or cease or cease for making. Um, and it's been interpreted as suggesting that he was less known for acting because he was um, making the plays. Another effect of the actualists is that aggregates all of the plays contained in the book to the Chamberlain's and King's Men, despite the fact that a number of them were performed before the formation of the Chamberlain's Men in 1694. It's notable in particular that Edward Alain was not appear here. Although he was in strangers in Henry Hennings, Phillips, and Pope Brian Cowley, 1593, and then appearance in Shakespeare's own plays. Another effect is to raise the work of those attached to the company who were not sharers, such as hired men, many of the companies were apprentices, retired men and women, playhouse gatherers, bookkeepers, scribes, and also women who had financial stakes in playhouses, such as Winifred Burbage Robinson. Who was married successively to Richard Burbage and Richard Robinson. In fact, the totalizing effect of the actor list is undercut by the text of the plays themselves, in which actors' names occasionally appear in stage directions and speech prefixes. These alert us to the dependence of these men on hired men and apprentices, and also to the inclusion of materials that predate the Chamberlain's men, or certainly in the 1594. So these are quotations from the second and third parts of the number six, the induction to the table of the shrew, much to about nothing and missing in that stream, with the name of actors and minor roles. The two extracts at the top of the um, third part of the number six, the one in the middle is from the second part of the number six, and then you have the extracts from much ado, table of the shrew, and missing in that stream. The names in the third part of the number six may speak to a period before the formation of Chamberlain's Men in 1584. Gabriel, who played Messenger, is probably Gabriel Spencer, born in April 1576. 
He was with Pembroke's men in 1597 and the Admiral's men in October the same year. He died in a duel with Ben Johnson in September 1598. Sinclair, who played the keeper in the third part of Henry VI, must be John Sinclair or Sinclair. He was on the continent in 1596 when he appears to be in female roles and was with the Chamberlain's men by 1597 to 98 when he appears in the plot of the second part of the seven, second part of the seven deadly sins, which the Chamberlain's men probably performed, um, as I've said, around 15, 1597 and 1598. Humphrey might be Humphrey Jess, who was born in December 1576. He may also be playing on the continent in the early to mid 1590s. His brother Anthony definitely was. And both of Jeff's brothers appear as members of Yaron's men in October 1597. But these actors, therefore, only seem close linked with Chamberlain's men. It's possible, but not certain, that these actors came together in a Pembroke's men cast of the early and mid 1590s. But as Lena outlined yesterday, this is a complex text in which early and late components jostle against each other. Of the actors named in the second part of Henry VI, John Holland appears alongside Sinclair in the plot of the second part of the Seven Living Sins. No actor named Bevis has yet been traced, but it may be significant that John Holland had a son called Bevis, who was baptized in May 1601 and buried in August 1603. The other allusions here point to revivals of the Tame of the Shrew, much to that nothing in the Summer Night's Dream, in the 1610s or early 1620s. Sinclair's line, I think to a Soto that you're on a knees, appears to allude to a character in Fletcher's Women Pleased, which was probably first performed between March 1619 and June 1623. John Wilson, who's recorded playing the singing boy Bathurst in Folio, went on to compose for the King's Men to serve as city weight and royal listeners. He was apprenticed to John Hemmings on 18 February 1611, 16. Another musician, William Toyer, also appears in the list of those employed by the King's Majesty's servants in their quality of playing as musicians and other necessary attendants, which is dated 27 September 1624. The 1623 folio thus presents a diachronic composite arrangement in which seemingly accidental references to minor actors within the text complicate the smoother corporate presentation of the paratext materials. The 1616 folio was published while its author was still alive, and the most recent of its plays had been performed five years before it appeared on booksellers' stories. The 1623 folio was published seven years after the author's death, and around a, around a decade after the performance of the most recent of its plays in the year. The 1647 folio is yet more removed from its original theatrical moment. It was published seven years after the death of Philip Massinger. His contribution to the folio's plays notoriously outweighs that of every dramatist other than Fletcher himself. But 22 years after the death of Fletcher, and 31 years after the death of Beaumont, its other authorizing figure. Its most recent play had been premiered in 1626 after Fletcher's death. Like the 1623 folio, 1647 folio was the product of negotiations between the King's men and the stations. On the 7th of August 1641, Robert Devereux, Second Earl of Essex, who had succeeded Philip Herbert as Lord Chamberlain, wrote to the Masters and the Wardens of the Stations Company, basically warning them off, authorizing the publication of the King's men plays, um, saying that the plays which are his Majesty's servants who addressed themselves ultimately as falling to my predecessors and others of this. Complaining that some players are about to print and publish some of their plays, which hitherto they have been usually restrained by the authority of the Lord Chamberlain. Um, and he grants this request and includes a, it closes a list of the plays to which they now lay claim, um, saying that if any of these plays should be offered to the press under another name than is in the list expressed, I should desire your care they may not be defrauded by that means, but they be made acquainted with it before they be reported in your hall. And so have opportunity to show their right unto them. So the plays that are yes to restrict the publications of the plays of the Kingsman generally, but then encloses this list of plays to which they now lay claim, 
apparently those under the threat of immediate occupation. And the majority of those players included in the list eventually appeared in the station's register, inventory by Humphrey Robinson and Humphrey Mosley on the 4th of September 1646, so five years later. By 1646, the King's men were in a much weaker position. I've summarised here some of the events of the decade between the closure of the playhouses at the outbreak of the Civil War in 1652 and the publication of the 1652 edition of Wild Goose Chase. And you can see there's a number of prohibitions against the theatre. There are various activities of the, the King's men as a group signing the Fogo dedication, but also um, being involved in surreptitious performances. And then also signing bonds and being involved in attempts at reviving companies at those moments at which it looked as if prohibitions might be lifted. Like the 1623 folio, the 1647 folio allied to the fact that several of the plays that it includes were not originally performed by the King's men, even though at least some of them were later acquired by them, such as the coxcomb, first performed by the children of the rebels, and the honest man's fortune, first performed by Lady Elizabeth's man. The 1647 folio presents paratextual elements that echo those of the 1623 folio. The dedicatory epistle is signed by members of the King's men and addressed to the surviving brother of the pair of dedicatees addressed by Hemmings and Condon. Yet the events of 1642 to 1647 mean that these elements register in different ways, acting as a memorial not just for individual actors, but the company itself. The actors who signed the dedicatory epistle are the surviving sharers. Minus William Robbins, who died in 1645, and Michael Barrier, who died in 1656. And the dedicatory epistles and poems refer repeatedly not only to the suppression of the theatre industry in 1642, but also to performances of the 1630s and early 1640s. In one notable, notable example, in his dedicatory poem, Henry Harrington refers directly to the act immediately in the midst of the war. Um, talking about scenes, chased yet satisfying. Ladies can't say those even was carried, but so did the play. Judgment could ne'er to be something to be, but low in Taylor air very spicy. So Stephen here is Stephen Hamilton, the youngest signatory of the dead patriot of the song, who had begun his career with the King's Men in the early 1630s when he played female roles and had graduated to the leading male roles by the late 1630s. And he appears to become the object of intense fascination from female playgoers in particular. There's a number of allusions to the extent to which women will be disappointed if Stephen doesn't get the girl at the end of the play. <laughs> a similar nod to later Caroline performances appears at the end of the text of the Christian of the Country, which presents two pairs of prologues and prologues. Um, and one of them is headed another prologue of the Christian of the Country. For my son Clark. And Clark here is Hugh Clark, who joined the King's Men around 1646 and is like Hamilton, one of the signatories to the folio extended history of the city. Like the 1623 folio, the 1647 folio is a diachronic volume. And it's also one in which the presence of actors of lower status complicates the picture offered by its materials. These extracts represent actors at three different stages of their careers in the 1630s and at different generations. The top two extracts are both from the man lover. Edward Horton was a boy actor with King's Men, who also appears as Mariana in a printed cast of his daughter Carlyle, the observing favourite, printed in 1629, not long after its first performances. <coughs> the man lover was revived at court in 1630, and the folio's text may date from the man's time. Richard Baxter, in contrast, is a long serving member of various companies. Born around 1593, he's first reported with Queen Anna's men around 1606, becoming a sharer in back of 1623. He was acting with the King's men by around 1628, and at the time of the folio's publication, he recently returned to the on continent. He was to become a founding member of the Restoration King's Company, formed with them from around 1606 to 1665. Dying in 1667. The final actor, Roland Dowell, was born around 1607, was a hired man with the King's Men over a number of years. He first appears in annotations to the Playhouse manuscript of Massenger's Believers for Blizzard in 1631, 
and he appears here in three different plays revived by the King's Man in the mid to late 1630s, Last Pilgrimage, The Gospel, and Chances. Um, and my favorite of these is Enter Roland with <laughs> He was mentioned in 1641 where Elizabeth Wheaton, the friend of Henry Condor and his wife Elizabeth, who had a gatherer's place at the Globe and Blackfriars. And like Robert Richard Baxter, he was alive in um, 1647 when the folio was published, dying in 1655. So juxtaposing the 1623 and 1657 folios reveals how difficult it was for the producers of multi-play folios to produce a universe, univocal text. The plays themselves contain material that undercuts and complicates the volumes of heritage materials. The memorializing function of the 1657 folio is even more pronounced in its postscript, the 1652 single play folio of Wild Goose Chase. The Wild Goose Chase had been intended to be included in the folio, appearing in the list of plays entered in the Stations Register by Robinson and Mosley in 1656. But when the book was printed, the manuscript had Found. Mosley complains in the station to the reader that a person of quality borrowed it from the actors many years since, and by the negligence of the servant, it has never returned. And it's always the servants that <laughs> stories about this place or just read place. Um, Mosley offers a report for whoever they have to have peace with it if you please to send it to them. <laughs> Between 1647 and 1652, the manuscript of Barbara's place was apparently covered. And it was printed in folio so that it could be bound with copies of the 1647 folio, the states of which many copies survive. And this is one um, that was sold at Christie's in October last year. And you can just about see the final page of four plays or more representations in one, the final page of the 1647 folio next to the title page of the World Histories. Yet this volume doesn't simply present a new text bound with the 1647 folio. It makes its own intervention into the moment of its publication through its extensive paratextual materials, which act as a buffer between the four plays in one and the world is chase and copies such as this one. While the remaining sharers in the King's Men gather to present the plays of the 1647 folio to readers, the 1652 folio is presented to two of their number only, John Lyle and Joseph Taylor's. The title page declares that the play has been retrieved for the public delight of the genius and private benefits of John Lyle and Joseph Taylor, servants of his late majesty, their person of honor. And the edition is framed by materials relating the play, not only to the king's men, but to learn and to themselves. The paratexts include a dedication to the honor to few lovers of dramatic prosy, signed by Lowen and Taylor. And the dramatist persona augmented the details of the actors who played the roles. The dedicatory poems include an epigram upon the long lost and fortunately recovered world use chase, mm -hmm. and a season of bestowed upon Master John Mallon and Master Joseph Taylor for their best advantage, which refers specifically to Lowell and Taylor, although rather disrespectfully as, as Joe's and Jack, um, who are hung with it for want of foul and sack. Um, and the noble person's uh, noble has found out by which he had revived and day two poets and two actors with one play. In the dedication, Learner Taylor relate the play forcefully to the circumstances of his performance. They first recall Fletcher himself watching the play performance, writing, The play was of so generally received acceptance that he himself spectates. We have known him unconcerned and to wish it had been known of his, he as well as the film theatre. In despite of his innate modesty, applauding this rare issue of his brain. <laughs> they then return to the present moment of case publication, writing, It is not unknown to you all how by a cruel destiny we were long time in needs and found, though our miseries have been sufficiently clamorous and expanded, yet till this happy opportunity never does affect your open ears and hands. It's important to bear in mind the precise context of the publication of plays during the Civil War Commonwealth Protectorate. The 1647 folio was published before the execution of Charles I, and some of the dedicatory verses refer to the anticipated return of the Queen's London. Richard Green refers to the King's second coming to his court, and James Shirley concludes his poem with the lines As I go swan like out, our peace is mine, a balm unto wounded age I sing. And nothing now is wanting but the 
king. As yet a controller remains, it appeared amid simmering hopes that the end of the conflict would eventually lift the restrictions on that. In contrast, in the time between the publication of the 1647 and 1642 folios, Parliament passed a new ideologically driven prohibition of theatre. Yeah, so that's the decree of the 9th of February um, 1648. This was followed by a crackdown on surreptitious performance during which the Fortune Playhouse was wrecked. Um, then the king was executed and the Black Friars were sold in 1651, a year before the publication of the 1652 folio. In this context, the ending of the epistle is yet more poignant. Lowen Taylor writes, but be the comedy of actual mercy as we are. Only we wish that you may have the same kind joy in reason of it as we had in the act. So excellent, your grateful servants, John Mellon, Joseph Taylor. As Heidi Craig comments, the paratextual apparatus of wild goose chase memorializes a dead theatrical tradition. The actors themselves awkwardly outliving their professional usefulness. So unlike the 1657 folio, the 1652 folio can no longer imagine the reader of the professional stage. So just a couple of remarks to conclude. I'd argue today that we should not be misled by the title pages of books such as the 1616 folio, the 1623 folio, and the 1647 folio with their emphasis on authors. These are also books that embody in various ways the pain from the performance and books that speak to the systems of power within the early 17th century theatre industry, in which the king's men were increasingly dominant and the most powerful men within these systems were company sharers. Yet the very capaciousness of these collections means that they also contain materials that undercut these powerful gestures by powerful men, such as the epigrams in the 1616 folio that mention other actors, or the appearance of actors of lesser status in stage directions Prefixes of the 1623 and 1647 folios. In the 1647 and 1652 folios, the gesture that spoke to power and influence in the 1623 folio, such as the dedication signed by Humphrey Shares, become instead a means through which the actor's vulnerability can be expressed. Where earlier books memorialize individual actors, these folios memorialize the company itself and the commercial stage over which the king's men form. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lucy. That was absolutely fascinating and so rich. Um, and I'm left thinking about these uh, scenes chased yet satisfying in moments of pleasure. Um, is this maybe a clue as to why Middleton didn't get selected uh, into an addition? Um, who could possibly say? Um, yeah, effective plays aren't really as chaste as that suggests. That the, the chasteness there is, is a strategic thing. But they are certainly satisfying. Um, uh, I'm really fascinated by this, this idea that the theatrical memorialization is almost baked into the format, possibly, and in ways that maybe we wouldn't see in Johnson. Um, uh, quite as immediately as it's sometimes the case kind of later on. Um, that got me thinking too as well about what's happening with the companies at the point when, when these photos are coming out. Um, I'm wondering, is, it, is the Shakespeare folio particularly unusual in that so many of those plays we know are still in repertory um, and still so kind of central to the companies? Um, uh, and Massex, I suppose, uh, on the stage, I think we've got 12 points of call year before Winter's Tale. 1623 or 24, sorry, I can't remember exactly. Um, is there still Johnson in, in the kind of Kingsman's Record Tree in 1616, um, for example? Yeah, so, I mean, there's, there's various theories, for instance, about every man in that that vision of date or around the time of the location of the Bible. Johnson certainly is still a central figure for Kingsman in, in 1616, um, and plays like I've seen. Seem to be still in the repertory at that point. Um, <laughs> there's not a huge number of um, 
records of core performance and things in the 16 teams. There's a bit of a difficulty there, so it's slightly difficult to plan you know, what's happening to Johnson's place within the case time repertory at that point in time. But things like the annotated terms of portfolio suggest that there were quite a good sort of portfolio mechanism in the sort of mid late 16 teams. So, yeah, I think Johnson is still quite, quite central to, to what the King's men are doing. But the point about the usage of three I think is a really important one that the there does seem to be a real currency of, of some of the folio only plays in the couple of or two or three years before the publication of the city folio. So the court form that City mentioned, did, did you mention 12 times? Yeah. Um, yeah, 12 times we just tell. Um, 12, I think 16, 18, but I'm sorry, 16, 18, yeah. And also actually a couple of other plays that appear in the folio that have been printed earlier, such as Hamlet, that appear in the 16, 19, 20-ish kind of list of plays, probably projected for performance. Um, if you look across the repertories at that moment in time, the Tempest is really prominent as well. It was a whole little string of plays, some of them by the King's Men, some by other companies, that all seem to be half in the back in the Tempest. And so there seems to be a kind of currency. Like, I'd be really surprised if the Tempest wasn't revived at some point around around 1620. So you have plays like Fletcher's The Sea Voyage, um, which you know, riffs quite directly with the Tempest as, as driving back the in the late 17th century. Um, the Double Marriage, which also leads to it. Um, and you've got a play for the two noble ladies, which is called by one of the other companies, and, and there are other examples as well. Um, so I think there is something about the, the publication of the folio edition of Shakespeare's plays in 1623 at a point where his, his plays are only become more prominent in these plays, even though the King's Men clearly found Fletcher's plays extremely highly. Um, and that's just something I think to, to why you get this, this intense kind of King's Men framing in the city of portfolio. It's making a claim about the status of Shakespeare, the status of the King's Men, the status of Shakespeare for the King's Men, and, and all of those kind of intersecting. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to uh, restrain myself from hogging on the questions and um, open this up to the floor, and I'll bring the road and mic. Um, uh, questions? I should also say this this was written entirely newly for today, so it's very much work in progress. I mean, thanks, Lizzie. That was <laughs> really interesting and really persuasive. But one thing I want to say that now seems really obvious to me that I really thought about, and then I can actually touch as well. The, the obvious thing though that I was kind of is in the 1650s, he's mostly starts printing editions where it's saying on the type page as it was performed by the late Majesty's service. And the way I have to read that is we can expect to say, but it's also sent that the king's company expects as well as the sent, and that kind of ties in with the sort of memorialized thing that you're seeing in your paper. And I, I haven't really thought about that at all. My question is about James Shirley. Um, what do you think about Shirley um, being called in to kind of authorise the moment of the French volume in the sense that he's got a couple of two poems, which is sort of, or sorry, two prefatory pieces, which is more than a little bit, they're quite prominently placed. And he's not a king's man writer, he's kind of conspicuously a kind of writer, obviously. Um, and I just wonder, well, is that interesting? Is that just this is the only book that's alive? Here's everything going on. Yeah, that's a great question. I, I did have a paragraph that talked about Shirley <laughs> Because um, I was worried about overrunning. Um, so, yeah, so Shirley's really prominent there. I think some of the most prominent figure is Mosley himself, um, and he has a preface, and he also has the last of the three poems. But, but Shirley does have this intransition. And Shirley actually was writing just before the theatre was closed. Yeah. So he's writing plays like the Cardinal, the early 1640s of the sisters. Um, and, and he and Bruma, they're partly because they're they're two of the most, the most important playwrights in 1642, whose careers are cut off by the close of the pieces. Um, Broom, in some ways, is, is more, it is an odder choice, actually, because he had written for the King's Men um, in the late 1620s, early 1630s, but then didn't write for, for, as far as we can tell, for the rest of his career. So for Broom to be writing the preface is, is more of a kind of return. Although, actually, he was, he was writing for the King's and then Shirley also wrote for who performed quite a few of the plays that are in, um, you know, in the Fletcher Canon, although I think fewer of them in his particular 
Tobio, the case of Tobio has a place that happens in particularly. So, um, so yeah, I think there's a, I think there is a kind of strategy of having Shirley writing these materials that these in a way there's a sort of there's a line that goes between that goes Shakespeare, Fletcher, Massinger, Shirley, in terms of you can write very intensely spend certain times. Um, Massinger's possibly a bit more complex because some records that have been slight you know, in the last 30 years or so suggest that he's maybe writing a bit more widely. Um, but there is that sense that there's a succession of writers who have these, these central kinds of worlds. And Shirley's involved in the publication of Fletcher Plays in the 30s as well, and he's involved in revising Fletcher Plays for the his career as men. So I think most importantly, saw him as a sort of um, a useful person to have that kind of role within them. Um, and listen, those, those property prices are extraordinary anyway. You've got one per play, so they take up an extraordinary amount of room in the portfolio. Um, and you get all of these, these um, noblemen and gentlemen, various people with claims to a home lecture or to a home moment. And then finally, you get room, you get Shirley, and then you get Monsley. So there's something in the way that the the, the dramatists the, the dramatists for the commercial stage can post things out before you get those in the big bit. But yeah, I need to think about that. Questions, further questions? Thanks, Lucy. Thanks so much. Can I ask you to go back to one of your slides? Um, the one that was that's the back the, back book, sorry. from the 1623 photo Shakespeare, but it, the one that's the names of the bits of characters. You can just slide that page. It was really brilliant to hear about how um, steeped in theatricality all those folios are. And I loved in your talk the way that some of that is sort of intentional, and that's pages like this one that we'll perhaps see, and some of it's kind of unintentional with the names of particular biographical players that almost seem to be there by accident instead of speech people so kind of peek through in ways that maybe they shouldn't. And I was thinking also about other accidents that are sort of reminders of the attributes of bits. Some pages of the folio, the theory is, are only there, some of the dramatists were so naive because maybe there was an error in casting off and so they need to fill up the space and so they use that space to remind us of characters and characters. So it's filled with all these reminders of theatricality and I was really interested while you were talking in that tension um, between intentionality and non-intentionality in the presence of theatricality. And the slide I, I meant actually was the, the fact, the image of the page of the, yeah. And if I'm right, that top bit says something like the works of William Shakespeare. Could you think, yeah, containing all these comedies, histories, and tragedies truly set forth according to their, um, their first originals. Okay. First original. So that is a chunk of text that seems to present a, a way of thinking about literary value that is originary. The works of Shakespeare and their value is that they're true according to their original status, their originary status from Shakespeare. And then underneath it is this very intentional thing that says, and their value is in the evolution of repertory and collaboration and participation and mutuality and those sorts of things. And I think my question is, is that, what's, how, what should we make of that? It seems sort of weirdly, after your talk, newly incoherent to me and kind of looking in two different ways. And I don't know why we give it a pass. It seems weird. It's, yeah, it's really odd, isn't it? It, it does look to some extent as if the, the different bits of that page are doing, doing different things and they're slightly displayed together um, in this particular page. But I think, I think the, the Shakespeare folio, the Shakespeare folio is a weirder book than we sometimes recognise. Um, partly because it's, it's trying to serve different functions at the same time. And part of that, I think, comes from the fact that it, the Henry's and Condor are being so involved in it. Um, and I think, in a way, the clue is the way in which um, Henry's and Condor refer to Shakespeare in their preface. Um, 
I'm just trying to find the quotes. Yeah. So when they talk about his friend and fellow and our Shakespeare. And I think to some extent, her name's of Pundle's Shakespeare is the Shakespeare who produces originals and who produces these, these texts that they're trying to represent truly according to the claim, even though it's not really borne out necessarily by the text itself. Um, so I'm not sure if Hemings and Condor is necessarily that big a gap between presenting Shakespeare as author and presenting Shakespeare as company. I think then they need to be reminded of ways that that we can't see because we're we're more accustomed to page to stage slightly different sort of things. Um, and yeah, I think the key is the the extent to which they can, but they seem to want to think of, of Shakespeare as somebody embedded with still all these his legs are within their own structures, but he's still their fellow. I think. Um, I need to work on this. Oh, sorry. Something on that point very briefly. Um, just, just, to, just to say on that one, I, I wonder whether one of the things that we're also seeing um, in this period is a sense that the quality of the acting in a very illogical way reflects on the quality of the play. So I'm thinking, for example, Hayward has this kind of period where he's doing quite a lot of retrospective um, paratexts for plays of people who are now dead. And quite often he says, this is a really good play. The acting was top quality. And it's got nothing to do with anything at that moment, those plays are not in repertory, those people are not being asked to remember having seen them, they are simply being told, because the acting was good, this is a good play. Um, so I wonder if that peculiar slippage is kind of operating there in, in that sense. Um, sorry. That's good. Uh, yeah. Yes, I, I, I wanted to say something about readers, and particularly the first readers, because they went to plays because they liked actors, and some of these actors were stars. And they went to see them perform. And sometimes you uh, think that they're more interested in the actors than the text. Uh, but I guess this changed with time because later readers just didn't know the actors anymore. So to them, they were dead, or they probably knew their reputations, but nothing more. So could you tell us more about this? Yeah, I, th I think that's, I, I, I really like that with the team. I think that's particularly true of, say, Richard Burbage in the 1623 folio, that you know he'd only died four years previously. Um, it's been suggested, I think, for quite a reason that, that Burbage may well have been involved in sort of initial planning of the folio volume with the Hemings and Cottle, which seems quite reasonable to me. Um, and, and, and there is a sort of, I think, with the Kingsman. They move Joseph Taylor being picked in there as a sort of a speed succession. Um, but I think there is still a sense of the loss of the Burbage that, that sort of hangs over the, the King's Men and the early sisters. Um, and again, maybe one of the reasons why, why Joseph Taylor is also in that list, even though strictly speaking, maybe it doesn't quite belong. Um, but this, yeah, this sense to which when when early modern readers, you know, in the earlier part of the century are reading these plays, they read the actors as they do so. Um, and I think you can probably think of that in relation to some later forms of publication and theatrical and even filmic kind of texts as well. There's a weird sense in which not that many people these days read screenplays, even though they're published a lot. But when you read a screenplay, and I, and I teach film, so I do it every screenplays, it's often quite hard to read a screenplay without thinking of the person. And I think there's there's some of that going on with the with these texts as well. And it's a form of reading that the that the paratextual materials in these photos are encouraging is something that the course of text of courage when they just title pages you know, as it was performed by even when that text might be one that that actually is a pre-performance text or, or doesn't relate that closely to a specific performance. Um, so yeah, I think it's a, it's a lovely point to Thank you. Um, thank you so much. Just to, I just wanted to say I I I love the fact that you talk about the the 1623 folio as being, you know, contradictory and 
dramatic, and our Shakespeare for having as a Google. Um, but of course, in the paratext, they have Johnson's My Shakespeare. And that would lead readers perhaps to also remember, um, you know, things that Johnson said about how wrong the actors were. And he says the actors were to have um, praised Johnson for the wrong reasons. That's typical Johnson. It's like, no, you can't praise somebody. You have to praise them for the right reasons. You don't praise Johnson because he never blotted a line. Shakespeare, thank you. <laughs> because he never blotted a line. That's a foolish, and in fact, you know, for Johnson, a problematic form of praise that ends up being an insult. Anyway, I'm just wondering if those echoes are there. I think, I think that's our... Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and it's interesting that I mean one of the things that that probably brings Johnson and Shakespeare together in the first place is writing for the Kenyans man, and there's all of those anecdotes. We don't know what kind of basis they have in them, but it was Shakespeare who first kind of recognised that there was something in in every man in his humour. It's probably you know, later kind of you know romanticising, but there is something about the relationship between these these two men, you know, both writing, not exclusively in Johnson's case, but writing extensively for the Chinese and King's Man, and Shakespeare writing for the King's Man. Um, and I wonder whether when, I think when Johnson says my Shakespeare, it, it, that possessive is really complicated, um, you know, as your question suggested, it's sort of a marvelous kind of way. Um, but I think for Johnson, for Johnson, my Shakespeare is, is to some extent is, is is my colleague as well in the same way as as Holmes and Humble's our Shakespeare is that kind of and I think one of the interesting things Johnson does in quite a lot of his his sort of critical writing in both senses of the term critical is that he, he draws distinctions between different kinds of writers for the stage you know the ones that he thinks are, are poets and the ones who are merely I don't know, stage you know, playwrights or whatever. Um, and, and Shakespeare is clearly on the, the good side of that divide, but nonetheless, because he's Johnson, he can't resist also kind of picking away at things. Um, and one of the, the I think, the extraordinary things about Johnson is that he he clearly, you know, clearly admires Shakespeare in all sorts of ways, but is clearly intensely frustrated by him as well. For, for not writing plays in the way that he writes plays. Or I mean, you say keeping, but you could also put a spin on it saying making the correct distinctions. <laughs> yes, which is what yeah, which is what is the bottom. You know what I mean? By 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 splitting the hairs, yes, you can call it making the compliment. Means for posterity you may be exactly the right thing. But anyway. It does, yeah. <laughs> and I think it's the final thing I'll oh. say on, on Johnson's comments and Shakespeare is the the context in, in the kind of documents in which those comments are by as well. You know, things like on Facebook, the, the the conversations with Bill you know, there's there's interesting things about where those comments come from and how they come down to us, which we probably need to, to push at a bit more than some of us are. Thank you. So yeah, thank you for the wonderful work of uh, Detective Denise taking us through all these references to actors and fascinating um, and showing us how books memorialize it much more than what they see up to the um, Wonderful. Uh, I had a question about these um these names of actors that appear secondary actors. And I was wondering if I mean you use the term undercut several times. So I was wondering if it's if the book is really undercutting things it's about to do or if, is there still, if there's just if there's just different projects that just 199 cents. it's the French people so yeah how much shift the numbers. We will erase everyone's memory at the end of the session. <laughs> <laughs>
One of the most interesting is in the course edition of Much Ado, where um, you have its dog really emerges and the speech prefix is named at the power of the house. And so, yeah, there are things like that. And, and that, those don't make it through to the folio text, but then the folio Much Ado has the reference to Jack Wilson. So, with Much Ado, you've got, you've got two different, um, different reaction themes. Actually oriented or actually reflected texts that are going. And yeah, I mean, I use the word on the cut because I think there's a, I think there is a sort of a tendency for the, the, the preparatory materials in these volumes to, to, to really emphasize the sharers and to emphasize the most, the most powerful people within the conference as part of the conference. Um, and what you get within I guess themselves are, are things that, that complicate that scene, but kind of insist that the is, is more than sharers, it's these other people as well. Um, and that was why I was just the word on the cut. Um, I guess I wouldn't want to, I was using undercut rather than subvert because I'm not quite sure to what extent it's, I don't think it's really questioning the way that the, the sharers are presented precisely. But it, but these references are suggesting that there is something that the future is bigger than the factory materials are suggesting. Um, and actually, there's like a, a lovely way of phrasing this. I need to go with the sort of I think it's Ben talking about the intentional versus unintentional, the kind of in collecting these tests together, and um, whoever is responsible for it. I don't think they, oh, yes, let's continue these ones that got the, the minor actors' names and that would be interesting. I think it was the text that they had that they wanted to print, and they just happened to have these things in them. So there is that extent to which you know, it's almost like text and subtext. It's quite specific, it's two different, different um, lines of sort of the action for referentiality for the text. So the names are names that appeared in the portos are erased then in the folio. Also mean that simply there's not enough editing work that's common to the folio that I think these names should have been erased. I don't think they're deliberately erased. I think it's just or certainly in the case of the much do text, it's just that a different text is being used and it's a text the, the, in which the, the stage directions and speech prefixes are different from the the earlier text. Um so I don't I think the Johnson folio is different. I strongly suspect that he deliberately writes out the actors' names from the induction to simply as levels. Um, and and it's interesting that the, those actors' names just really got overlooked for a very long time because people were reading the photo text. Um, so I think the Johnson is different, which is a phrase I love saying a lot. Thank you very much, Sensen. Um, I have a question that's um, actually difficult to really talk, but I was wondering whether you had any thoughts about connections between the Rose List of 
because you've got things like the car ride volume, um, which as you say is, is adopting this, this phrasing on this title page. You've got things like read the room, Shirley, Biden plays volumes from the uh, 1650s. Um, I think the Cartwright volume is particularly interesting because there's a there's a Cartwright poem in the folio, the, the, the Bones of Fletcher folio as well. So there's an extent to which I think for mostly Cartwright is a sort of an important kind of cog within this royalist kind of education project that, that he has. Um, and Cartwright's interesting because he's a university dramatist. Um, and it's interesting that university dramatists by this point can be printed in similar ways to the commercial stage playwrights. And that's something you can think in some ways distinctive to a 1650s kind of moment in which it's almost like the category is, has become plays rather than university plays and commercial theatre plays. But yeah, I need to be quite And we have time for one more question for uh, lunch. Lisa, can I ask you one, one point of question? <laughs> um, have you thought about the wild goose chase in this kind of um, highly misunderstood, but also the, the ways in which it's reconstructing and kind of tracing that um, stage history in relation to uh, kind of restoration drama um, and the kinds of paratexts that we get there? Do you, do you see it as kind of relating to what's coming next at all, um, especially with that kind of moment of kind of 16, uh, 48, 49, I think? I, I haven't done yet, but um, can I recommend an essay by Heidi Craig that's just come out of thinking of the University of Public Philosophy, which does do something like that, starts to do something like that, um, and, and is thinking about um, what she calls in play of power texts over a, a longer period, so she's going to the end of the end of the, the 17th century, and she yeah, she, she thinks about the the dramatist persona like this. In the world case chase in relation to, to what happens later in the way that restoration consists, start to include um, descriptions of actors' performances. Um, and this one doesn't really, it just kind of says, oh, this was wonderfully acted by so and so. It doesn't say anything specific. The restoration needs more specific. Um, but yeah, she she's, I think, sees a, a continuum between this edition and some of this. Uh, well, shall we thank Lucy one more time for a wonderful talk?